Uh, good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay, hands, yeah. Uh, I'm Shane Larson. I'm the Associate Director of Sierra, of Sierra uh, our Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics. I'm also a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here. Uh, this is homecoming weekend at Northwestern, as most of you know, and this is always one of our favorite weekends here uh, at Sierra uh, because we have our annual public lecture, which is why you're all here. We also have a big meeting with our board, who is here with us in the audience, um, and it's always a great opportunity to reflect on the things we do here at Sierra and what we're planning to do in the coming years. We do a lot of research here at Sierra. Uh, we have graduate students, undergraduates, faculty, postdocs um, who engage in astronomical research. That is research that's centered around astronomy, but not necessarily all of our people are involved in astronomy directly. We have computer scientists who work with us, engineers who work with us, data scientists who work with us. And so uh, the, the span of people that we work with here at Northwestern is quite broad and allows us to do all the amazing things uh, that you hear about in the news uh, in modern astronomy. So we're very happy to have you all here tonight. Um, we are very thankful to the Northwestern alumni who uh, helped fund this event for us. Uh, they uh, provide funds for us to bring in speakers um, and carry out this event every year. And so we're very happy uh, that they partner with us on this. Um, we will have the lecture, and we'll certainly have an opportunity for uh, Q&A afterwards. If you're interested in more of our events or engaging with us, you can certainly find uh, more information at our website. That's sierra.northwestern.edu. There are ways to get on our mailing list there. There are ways to support us there um, if you're interested in that um, and join us for future events. We'll have another big public lecture in the spring where we'll feature someone from the Northwestern community, and that usually will happen in April or May. Okay? After the event, uh, there will be an opportunity for Q&A, as I said, but you may have noticed as you came in, out in the lobby, uh, there are a variety of people here from Sierra, as well as uh, partner departments from around the university. Tonight, in particular, we're joined by colleagues from English, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and talk to them after the event, uh, since Marsha can't talk to the hundreds of you who are here. Uh, so after the event, when we uh, turn you loose, please go out and feel free to ask them any questions you might have um, about the things we do, the things you heard about, other connections to astronomy you may be interested in. That's what they're out there for, uh, to help you get a feel for the kinds of astronomy and scholarship that we do here at Northwestern. Okay? So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, tonight is actually an auspicious night in the history of astronomy. It is actually, literally, the 100th anniversary of one of the most important observations ever made, and Marsha is here to uh, tell you that story. So, Marsha Bartujak uh, and I have known each other for many, many years, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be hosting her here. She did her undergraduate work in communications um, at American University. Uh, she then did her graduate work in physics at Old Dominion University before embarking on a career that mixed those two disciplines. And so for 40 years, she has been working on explaining and describing the work we do in science to very broad audiences. Um, she is the author of seven different books. Uh, she has, uh, in 2010, won the award, uh, History of Science Davis Prize for the story she's about to tell you tonight. She's a three-time winner of the American Institute of Physics Science Writing Prize, and she's also the uh, winner of the Germont Award for, and this is the quotation from the citation, significant contributions to cultural, artistic, and human dimensions of physics. Okay, so Marcia is a fellow of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. She is a spectacular science communicator, and we're very pleased to have her. So please give a warm Northwestern uh, welcome to Marcia Bartujak. Thank you so thank you so much, Shane. Woohoo! Oh, that I need. Maybe I shouldn't steal that. <laughs> <laughs> You have to wish me luck tonight. As we were walking here from the Sierra building, a black cat walked right across. <laughs> so uh, if anything goes wrong, it's the cat's fault. So we're here tonight to talk about the discovery of other galaxies, the fact that the Milky Way was not the sole galaxy in the universe. And this isn't. Uh, a recent idea, actually in the 18th century, 
the British astronomer William Herschel uh, observed a lot of nebulae in the sky, and he actually speculated that they may be other uh, Milky Ways, just like our Milky Way galaxy. And Immanuel Kant, at the same time, the philosopher Kant, uh, called them island universes, which was then used through the years, that, that great term, island universes. But by the turn of the 20th century, uh, astronomers came to think that these spiraling disks right here were baby solar systems in the making. And that sort of makes sense when you look at it. Doesn't it look like a little uh, solar system beginning? Here's the sun about to form, and here is the disk forming the planets. And that was the, the major idea that these spiral nebulae were just scattered around the Milky Way and forming new solar systems. But there were some astronomers, like James Keeler at the Lick Observatory, who began saying, no, we need to really study these. This was a time when all of the biggest astronomers were studying stars and planets. Nebulae, they were, they were low on the list of things to look at. So James Keeler was taking a big jump to spend his professional life studying these nebulae. And he took lots of pictures in the sky. And uh, he saw uh, many, many of these spiraling disks in the sky, started counting them, and he was seeing thousands of them. And it brought the nebulae uh, to the forefront. And unfortunately, Keeler died young. Uh, he was a, a heavy smoker, and he died of lung cancer. But later on, his uh, work was continued by this man, Heber Curtis. In the 1910s, he decided to uh, continue the work of James Keeler at the Lick Observatory using this great big telescope called the Crossley Telescope that had been uh, renovated, you know, making this big barrel, and it looks like the gun on a naval battleship. And he started looking and checking uh, at all the various spiral nebulae. This was a big telescope that was brought over from England uh, to Lick Observatory. Keeler first used it, and then Curtis took it up. Uh, Curtis was the man who almost discovered the universe. He surveyed the sky, and he estimated that there were at least a million of these spiraling disks in the sky. And he came to believe they really were other galaxies. Well, why did he start thinking that? Well, he started photographing some of them edge on. And he said, gee, those dark lanes are just like the dark lanes seen across the Milky Way galaxy. When you look at the Milky Way, you see those dark clouds. And then he also started sighting novae. These are stars that temporarily flare up and brighten um, uh, on the surface of a star due to a stellar explosion. And he looked at these novae in the spiraling nebulae, and he said, gee, if those novae are the same brightness as the ones we see closer in the Milky Way galaxy, they have to be millions of light years away. So you might think, well, then why doesn't Curtis get the credit for discovering other galaxies? It was because it was all circumstantial evidence. He didn't have a slam dunk, a direct measuring tape out to that galaxy. So it was still speculation at this point. It wasn't firm. He needed a cosmic yardstick that would enable him to measure directly to that galaxy. And fortunately, around that same time, someone found it. And it was due to this woman, Henrietta Leavitt, at the Harvard College Observatory. She was a specialist in variable stars. She looked at dozens and hundreds and thousands of different variable stars. And uh, she discovered that there was a particular star known as a Cepheid that there was a linkage between the period of the star 
and how bright it was. The brighter the star, the slower the blinking. And the relationship was really direct. So that meant that you could look far out, see a Cepheid, see its period, how it was brightening and dimming over time, brightening. And this period could be days, weeks, or months. But once you calibrated that, then you could see the period, you could count the period, and then you could estimate what its absolute brightness was, as if you were right next to it. And then you could say, but it's not that bright because it's far away from us. And then using simple optical rules, how the light travels through the universe and how it dims over, you know, over that distance, you can then determine the distance it had to have traveled to become so faint uh, to our eyes. This was a direct measuring tape that would take, before this, astronomers could only calculate maybe a few hundred light years with, with firm determination, determine the distances out to uh, different stars in the Milky Way. This allowed them to go far beyond thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of light years out. So this was the key. Henrietta Leavitt provided the key. And first, the, one of the first people to actually use this technique was Harlow Shapley, who uh, grew up in Mar uh, Missouri and as a teenager actually worked as a crime reporter on the newspaper. But, uh, and he was intending to major in journalism at college, but uh, when he ended up in college uh, at the University of Missouri, he went on to actually major in astronomy. Then he got his doctorate at Princeton. And once he graduated, he uh, went on to the Mount Wilson Observatory in California, then the greatest uh, observatory of its time. And uh, he began uh, measuring the distances using the technique that Levitt had provided to the globular clusters that surround the Milky Way like bees, bees hovering around a hive. And in this way, by noting the distances to the various globular clusters, he determined that the Milky Way was actually far larger than anyone had estimated. Before that, astronomers were thinking that the Milky Way was, oh, maybe 10,000 light years, maybe 30,000 light years wide. Well, he discovered it was far bigger. Uh, we now know that it is 100,000 light years wide. Well, this was so much bigger that he decided that the Milky Way was the universe and everything else was a mere appendage. And here we are, we're located off to the side. That's what uh, uh, Shapley also discovered. He discovered that not only was the Milky Way bigger, that our sun was not located in the center. And he liked to say the solar system is off center and consequently man is too. And this was all around 1918. So he developed what he called the big galaxy model. Whoops, there we go. That was his interpretation. But as I mentioned before, Curtis was saying that there are other galaxies, that the Milky Way is not alone, that there are other island universes. So we had these two competing thoughts. The island universes, whoops, I didn't mean for Curtis to go away. Not quite yet, not quite yet, Curtis. You stay there. <laughs> so there was this competition. You had the big galaxy model versus the island universe model. This was around 1920, and these two had a big debate about that. But unfortunately, it was all still, the, the evidence was still hazy, and no one could decide for sure which way it was going. Uh, Curtis now 
could have continued at Lick Observatory, and we could have had the Curtis Space Telescope rather than the Hubble Space Telescope. But unfortunately, he got asked to be the director of the Allegheny Observatory in Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh. But, you know, he had a family. This was a big promotion to be a director. It was more money and more security. So off he went to Pennsylvania, right next to the steel mills, pouring out all that pollution. He never had a good observation in Pennsylvania from that point on. So eventually, bye-bye, Curtis. No more significant <laughs> discoveries. Shapley. Shapley was the one who first used the Cepheid me method to discover the, the, uh, the, the size and the location of us within the Milky Way. He could have continued to search for Cepheids beyond the globular clusters, but he didn't because he was mulishly wedded to his big galaxy model and insisted, no, there's no other galaxies. The Milky Way is it. The Milky Way, the sea of stars hovering in a, you know, a void of unknown dimensions. And so he lost the chance of discovering other galaxies. And it was a decision he would later regret. But by then, there was a newcomer in the field, Edwin Hubble. And he had arrived at Mount Wilson, worked for a while alongside uh, Harlow Shapley at Mount Wilson, straight from serving as an army major in World War I. Uh, the observatory's director, George Ellery Hale, was always on the search for the best students to bring in, you know, working on interesting problems. And he heard about uh, Hubble's work at the University of Chicago and promised him a job once he got back from the war. So uh, at first, Hubble stood in uh, Shapley's shadow at Mount Wilson. But in 1921, Shapley went off to the Harvard a college observatory to become its director. And so finally, Hubble had the big telescopes at Mount Wilson all to himself to study the spiral nebulae. And uh, there he is in all his glory. He was a complex man and very aloof with his colleagues. Uh, most of them were former farm boys from the Midwest, from your area. Uh, they had watched the nighttime sky from their farms and fell in love with the universe. And uh, Hubble, too, uh, grew up in Missouri and, uh, and uh, was an amateur astronomer as a youth. Uh, and uh, friends called him an Adonis. And he was fairly good looking. I always you know, like to say he looks like a little like the actor Jeremy Irons when he was young. And... Uh, he grew up, as I said, uh, in the Midwest. His father was in the insurance business uh, here near Chicago. Uh, and he went, uh, Hubble went to the university hoping to major in astronomy, but his father was absolutely set against it, would not allow it. And Hubble followed his father's opinion. His father wanted him to study the law. So he took both. He took some astronomy courses, but he also uh, did some pre-law. And he did very, very well, so well that he got a Rhodes Scholarship to go off to Oxford, England for three years as a Rhodes Scholar. And there he completely transformed himself. He began to speak with a British accent, learned a proper way to drink tea, uh, wore a black cape with great flourish. And he took to wearing knickers. Look at those knickers. That was his favorite observing outfit. Anytime you see a picture of him at the telescope, he's wearing his knickers. And he was a man who yearned to be somebody singular and distinct so much that he always added a bit of gloss to his resume. For example, he always told everyone at Mount Wilson that he left the law for astronomy. 
But when he came back from Oxford and went back uh, to, uh, to his family, uh, he didn't practice law at all. He taught high school for a year. He taught physics and Spanish, of all things, uh, for a year. Uh, during that time, his father passed away, which finally gave him the courage to quit the high school and go back to the University of Chicago for his PhD. And that's where he became fascinated with the spiral nebulae, making it the subject of his thesis, which got the notice of George Ellery Hale, who brought him after he served as a major in the army in World War I, came back to Mount Wilson. And he showed up just a week. He showed up on September 11th, 1919, just a week after the 100-inch started operation, the biggest telescope in the world at the time. And he began using the 100-inch uh, on Christmas Eve, 1919. And he kept this logbook to keep track of his observations. I had the most wonderful experience going to the Huntington Library where all his papers are kept. And they, I remember feeling uh, excited as they handed the logbook over the counter to me. Uh, I was unbelieving that they actually were going to let me see it and touch it. <laughs> I spent a whole day with it. It was just a wonderful experience. And page after page, you see his struggles uh, and his observations of the spiral nebulae. He told a colleague that he was going to, quote, determine the relation of nebulae to the universe. That was his goal. And he did it with single-minded devotion. He used both the 100-inch and also the 60-inch telescope there at Mount Wilson, going for years, target to target, spiral galaxy to spiral, well, spiral nebula to spiral nebulae at the time, uh, to try to figure out what was happening. And he labeled each photo he took. He labeled H for the 100-inch, the plate number in the sequence of his photographs, and H for Hubble. And in 1923, he spent 47 nights on the mountain. And that was the year that finally something surprising happened. And I'd like to read a passage from my book describing that. October 4th, 1923. The seeing was poor, but it was good enough, just barely, to stalk some celestial quarry that autumn evening. As the giant scope swung around, there was a whine, a series of loud clicks, and then a final clang as the instrument was secured into place. Hubble examined M32, a small and roundish nebula, for a spell, but he then maneuvered the telescope just a fraction of a degree to photograph M31, the famous Andromeda Nebula, the target of choice in the island universe debate. By then, the seeing had deteriorated to a point that other astronomers might have closed up shop. But Hubble persevered, and despite the mediocre viewing, soon noticed a new speck of light within Andromeda's cloudy veil. It was exactly what he was hoping to find one day as he conducted his extensive survey of the nebulae. Novi had been seen before in Andromeda, that wasn't startling, but Hubble was sure that additional sightings would help reveal Andromeda's secret. Nova suspected Hubble, let me, yeah, there, <laughs> I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. Nova suspected Hubble neatly wrote in black ink in his logbook for plate H331H. After photographing Andromeda for 40 minutes, he went on to another nebula, a barred spiral, before ending his run. He returned the next night. That was 100 years ago today. He returned the next night and again saw the new pinpoint of light. Confirms Nova suspected on H331H, he wrote in his logbook. So here is the actual photograph, the very famous photograph among the astronomical community. 
uh, which shows uh, what he had seen. What we're seeing there really is that black blob, uh, it's in a negative here, is the center of the Andromeda galaxy, all those stars sort of forming a cloudy uh, sort of uh, uh, oval there. And then you can see the two nova, and then something extra, because he left the mountain with this photograph and went back to his office and started comparing it with photographs of Andromeda that were taken in past years and past decades to see uh, what else he could find out about uh, these novae. And he could see that there were actually uh, two more novae, not just one. Uh, and by also comparing it to the others, he saw that one of them it wasn't just a flare up and that disappeared and never showed up again. He saw that it appeared and disappeared. It appeared and disappeared. It was a variable star. Well, you can see how excited he was by this revelation. He X'd out the N of that nova at the top and put in V A R exclamation point seeing the excitement in the very nature of, of those letters, he knew he had found celestial gold. Because here, possibly, just possibly, this was the cosmic yardstick that would allow him to determine the distance to Andromeda directly. He didn't know it yet, though, because he had to start keeping track of the variability of this star. So he returned to the mountain, taking pictures night after night. And it was three nights in the month of February 1924 that proved crucial. On the 5th, 6th, and 7th of that month, as you can see here on the right side of the graph, he saw the light of the variable shoot up. And he was finally able to get a full graph of how this variable uh, varied its light from the length of the, uh, length of the curve and the overall shape of the curve. He knew that his variable was a Cepheid, which is a rare type of variable star that is a thousand times brighter. Uh, than our sun, so they can be seen from long distances. This, this graph, when he wrote this in his notebook, this, in February 1924, was his moment of discovery. And he also went back to his notebook. And on uh, the right side there, you will notice he did a little addition. There it is, in the yellow. Here's from my book. Customarily reserved, Hubble at this moment is unmistakably restive. He didn't write his message in black ink, which he regularly did for his records, but instead in pencil. And his handwriting, usually so fluid and precise, was more hurried and askew. He was obviously elated. Quote, on this plate, three stars were found, two of which were novi, and one proved to be a variable, later identified as a Cepheid, the first to be recognized in M31. And to highlight the addition, he drew that big arrow pointing directly down to his historic news. And it's in this broad stroke that the arrow, literally, as I was sitting there in the archives, I said, this arrow literally makes his excitement just bounce off of the page. Um, I, in fact, I was a little surprised that uh, in other stories that I read in my literature searches, no other astronomer mentioned this. They, they mentioned the quote, but they didn't mention that you could actually see the emotions coming off the page. For once, Hubble, very reserved, dropped his guard and figuratively clicked his heels at this moment of discovery. Well. Hubble couldn't help but notify his nemesis, Harlow Shapley. They couldn't stand one another. When they were at Mount Wilson together, no, they couldn't stand one another. 
but they needed one another. Shapley was now director of one of the best observatories then in the in the world, the Harvard College Observatory, which had the best photographic uh, collection of photographic plates. Hubble was at the observatory that had the biggest telescope in the world. They needed one another in terms of uh, sharing or consulting on data. So uh, notice that Hubble, right there at the first paragraph, uh, didn't open his letter with polite niceties or inquiries of health. He got right to the point. You will be interested to hear that I have found the Cepheid variable in the Andromeda Nebula. <laughs> and then he went to all the descriptions of the technical details. It had a period of 31 days, varied between magnitude 18 and 19. That's very, very faint. And here's the kicker. He used the exact same formula that Shapley used for the globular clusters to determine that uh, that variable in Andromeda was at least one million light years away. We now know it's two and a half million light years, but this was the first calculation before they had all the, the proper calibration. And it meant no more circumstantial evidence no more speculation, no more guessing. Here was direct and indisputable proof that Andromeda was truly, truly a separate galaxy from the Milky Way. Well, Hubble got in some further digs at the end of his letter. At the end, he said, I have a feeling that more variables will be found by careful examination of long exposures. Altogether, the next season should be a merry one and will be met with due form and ceremony. <laughs> well, Shapley, upon receiving this letter in his office, held it up and told a colleague, here is the letter that has destroyed my universe. He knew right away the game was over, Hubble won. And... Uh, Actually, it, it's funny, he, he took a while, he played games with Hubble for a while, saying, oh, you have to check your data, you, you, you need to re, you know, check some of those calculations. But he knew, he knew right away. And actually, he became one of the strongest supporters of the island universe model after that, doing some really good substantial work on clusters of galaxies. So Hubble joined the bandwagon soon after this. Well, Hubble made that finding in February 1924, yet he held off publishing. I mean, today, can you imagine? You just discover the modern universe, that the Milky Way is not alone, that the universe is trillions of times bigger than you thought. He didn't say a word at first. Why? That was always a mystery as I was going uh, through my research. Why would he hold off? Well, basically, Hubble was very, throughout his life, fearful of being caught in a scientific error. He always wanted to be right. He always wanted his facts lined up in a row. And, uh, and a big reason was he had a colleague at Mount Wilson. His name was Adrian von Manen, who had also been looking at Andromeda, looking at its rotation. And Adrian von Manen was determined that he had seen the Andromeda Nebula actually rotate, that he could actually, from year to year, see a change, that it was rotating. Now, you could not possibly see this if Andromeda is truly one million light years away. This disturbed Hubble immensely. He was sure von Manen was wrong, but he couldn't pinpoint why. What was wrong? Von Manen was known as a great spectroscopist. Everyone admired his work. Where, where did von Manen go wrong? And he didn't want to make an announcement until he was sure that he could figure out what happened. So he just kept not saying anything, not making it official until, and he would have kept on waiting, until finally the noted Princeton astronomer, Henry Norris Russell, finally, you know, kicked Hubble in the behind and said, you've got to publish. You've got to send a, a paper to the next American astronomical meeting. And so that's indeed what Hubble did. Here's the paper. 
Uh, and it was presented on January 1st, 1925 at uh, the 33rd meeting of the American Astronomical Society. But Hubble didn't show up. He had Russell read the paper at the meeting. He was still, you know, a little fearful of having his name attached to something that he might have to take back. But this was the first official announcement. And that's the day you might say that Hubble officially revealed the modern universe, a cosmos brimming with other galaxies as far as you could see outward. Now, as the textbooks have it, Hubble went on four years later to discover the expanding universe, right? You've all heard that story, right? Well, that's not quite how it happened. Evidence that the spiral nebulae, they weren't known as galaxies yet, but the evidence that spiral nebulae were moving outward had already arrived much earlier using this 24-inch refractor at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And it was all due to this man, Vesto Slipher, one of my favorite astronomers. He was the first to obtain the speed of a spiral nebulae. He attached this spectrograph onto the 24-inch and carefully obtained a spectrum of the Andromeda Nebulae in 1912 very early on, far before Hubble was even thinking about nebulae. So while Curtis was at Lick, looking at all those, you know, seeing where all the different uh, spiral nebulae were located in the sky, uh, Slipher was at Lowell uh, determining their speeds. And he found that Andromeda was moving towards us at 300 kilometers per second. That was 10 times faster than any star that had been measured, whose velocity was measured within the Milky Way galaxy. This was an astounding speed to astronomers, that some object would be going 300 kilometers per second. And Slipher went on to determine uh, for those spiral nebulae that he could actually uh, take a spectrum of uh, in the sky from, from his location, uh, went on to examine all of them, and by 1917, he had gathered 25. He had determined the velocities of 25 spiral nebulae, and it was an extremely difficult test. The faintest one required 40 nights of exposure. That meant he would take his photographic plate, have the photons fall on it, take that same plate, try to put it in precisely, get some more photons, 40 nights, just to get one spectrum and determine the velocity of that nebula. He would go back and back week after week. And the result, well, these are the results. He found a few were approaching us, like Andromeda. They're in the blue. And that meant that as they were approaching, the light waves get compressed, they become bluer. And so you have the blue shift. But most of them, most of them were running away from us. That means the light waves were stretching out and the light was getting redder, the red shift. You've heard this term, red shift. And so he determined that most of these galaxies were running away. And some of them were whisking away at 1,000 kilometers per second, which was the fastest speed recorded by astronomer at that time. And by 1917, by the time he came out with this paper, he was agreeing with Curtis that they were likely other galaxies. Otherwise, they would have flown out of the Milky Way long before this. He even suggested, this is really interesting, in one paper he said these might be, this, this might suggest that the spiral nebulae are scattering. Sort of the first hint of that idea of an expanding universe, 1917. Well, 
a little brief aside. I had, to, I had to bring this into the lecture because in 1914, Slipher already had 15 of those velocities, and he presented his results right here at Northwestern University in what was then the Swift Hall of Engineering, where the American Astronomical Society was holding its meeting. I had the, 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 the lovely uh, uh, visit yesterday uh, to the Swift Hall uh, to see where this all happened. And it was at the end of Slipher's talk in this lecture hall, it's still there, the Annie Swift Auditorium. You can see it when you enter the Swift Engineering Hall. This is where he gave his talk announcing these fast spiral nebulae velocities. And the audience rose to their feet and gave him a standing ovation. And this had never, ever been witnessed at an astronomical meeting. And in fact, a colleague told Slipher at the time, your results compose one of the greatest surprises which astronomers have encountered in recent time. And someone in the audience that day, I believe, was very impressed, Edwin Hubble. He was just about to start his PhD at the University of Chicago. And that summer before, he went to this meeting. And uh, it was my suspicion that all the hullabaloo that was done over the results that Slipher had presented made Hubble decide that spiral nebulae was going to be his topic. So Northwestern, thank you. <laughs> and here's a group. Uh, the group photograph of the, the entire American Astronomical Society right there. <laughs> Can you imagine? I think there are thousands now showing up at these astronomical meetings. This was it. This was the whole group. And notice, there is Slipher right here, way in the back. Yesterday, my husband took a picture of me standing on these steps right where Slipher was. I really had a ball. So there he is, way back. He was such a modest, humble man. He didn't like to go to meetings. This was a rare occasion for him to actually be at a meeting. And uh, uh, so he, he just stood in the back. In fact, when asked to send his results to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, he responded, it only remains for me to do something worth sending. What? <laughs> but on the other hand, there was Hubble. He hadn't even started his PhD yet. And there he is, front and center, right there. <laughs> it showed the difference in personality between the, the, the two people and why you remember Hubble and not Slipher. <laughs> so what we had then was a vision of some galaxies were approaching us, but most others were running away. What did that mean? Was there a pattern to these movements? That was the next question. Once Hubble knew that they were actually separate galaxies, now the next question was, is there a pattern to these motions that were being seen? That was the big question to be solved. And to answer it, Hubble teamed up with Milton Humason, this is a man who started out as a janitor. He only had an eighth grade education, started out as a janitor, but started working on the telescopes to become one of its best observers. And his specialty was getting the spectra, just like Slipher, where Hubble got the distances working with the Cepheids. Humason would get the spectra to determine if the, gal the galaxy was approaching or moving away. So by 1929, Hubble was able to find a definitive pattern in the flight of the galaxies outward, long known as the Hubble law. Double the distance, double the velocity. Triple the distance, triple the velocity. There was a great relationship uh, between the velocities and the distance. What's really interesting, though, 
is all the velocity information. This is velocity versus distance on this map. All the velocity information did not come from Hummison because Hummison really was just starting his measurements. Most of that data was Slifer's data. And it was used by Hubble in this paper without citation or acknowledgment. He just used it. And uh, so I believe Slifer really deserves half the credit. I would love to see the Hubble constant become the Hubble Slifer constant because it was Hubble's distances and Slifer's velocities that gave us the constant of how fast the universe is expanding. Now, Hubble, though, had no idea at this point that the universe was expanding. He did not mention that interpretation at all in his paper. Uh, he always told people, I leave, leave theory to the theorists. And uh, the correct interpretation actually believe, belongs to this man, Georges Lemaitre, both a mathematical physicist and a Jesuit priest. And he predicted what Hubble found two years before, two years earlier. He predicted the Hubble law. In 1927, he published this paper, uh, a paper saying that, quote, the receding velocities of the extragalactic nebulae are a cosmical effect of the expansion of the universe. That's the first time you hear that term, expansion of the universe. Space-time was stretching outward, and galaxies were surfing along on the ride. He did this by setting up a cosmological model based on Einstein's relatively recent general theory of relativity. Uh, that was his specialty. And he soon met Einstein at a conference in Paris to excitedly tell him this news. Your theory is telling us that the universe is expanding, that it's moving. And Einstein hated this idea. And he told Lemaitre so. He said, your calculations are correct, but your physical insight is abominable. <laughs> Einstein just couldn't get it in his, or in his head that the universe, space time, would actually be moving. He preferred a universe, the old classical model. The universe was serene and stable and remained in place. Uh, well, it ended up that no one really heard about Lemaitre's idea. Lemaitre published his, this work in an obscure Belgian journal that no one else read. And then once Einstein tells you that your idea is abominable, you tend not to talk about it with other people, right? So the, uh, the credit uh, was lost for quite a while. The, of, of Lemaitre's great contribution to the interpretation of the observations that Hubble had conducted. It wasn't until 1930 that Lemaitre's paper was rediscovered and given its due. Then and only then was Hubble's observations finally interpreted as an expanding universe. And in fact, in 2018, astronomers renamed the Hubble Law the hubble lemaitre Law to give honor to Lemaitre's contribution. And it is ironic. The man we most closely identify with uh, revealing the expanding universe, he didn't really like the idea. He would acknowledge that an expansion of space-time was the best exclamation so far for what was happening. But he always made sure his papers would be written so his data would hold up, even if the explanation changed. He always called the galaxy speeds throughout his papers, through the 40s into the 50s, apparent velocities. When it's not too surprising, I mean, this was the era when quantum mechanics was overturning all the ideas of classical physics. He was thinking maybe something like that is happening. 
So uh, he was always afraid that there was going to be a new law of physics that snuck in and changed the interpretation. He was a doubting Thomas until the moment of his death in 1953. Take, for example, this comment he made in 1947 on the potential power of the new 200-inch telescope at Palomar Mountain that was about to be dedicated. He said that, whoops, did I leave it off? He said, uh, we may predict with confidence that the 200-inch will tell us whether the redshifts must be accepted as evidence of a rapidly expanding universe or attributed to some new principle of nature. God, he always wanted to be right no matter what. So he always hedged his bets. Well, historians of astronomy, uh, Helga Krog and Robert Smith, suggest that this, this legend that we all live with in all the textbooks was shaped by American astronomers desiring, quote, a founding father and a figure around whom they could drape a single version of the history of the discovery of the expanding universe. But we shouldn't forget. There were all those astronomers who came before him. James Keeler, Harlow Shapley, and Heber Curtis, Henrietta Leavitt, Vesto Slipher, and Georges Lemaitre. But Hubble remains the central figure because he did open up an entirely new field, modern cosmology. Now Hubble, who died in 1953, was only able to see a few tens of millions of light years uh, into distant space. That's almost like a local neighborhood to astronomers today. In fact, he once said uh, in a book, with increasing distance, our knowledge fades and fades rapidly. Eventually, we reach the dim boundary, the utmost limit of our telescopes. What he couldn't imagine were space telescopes. Like, whoops, there it is. He couldn't imagine that there were space telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, and now the Webb Space Telescope, taking us billions of light years back in time, seeing galaxies just as they were born right after the Big Bang. Moreover, we have now expanded our vision. We now have X-ray, ultraviolet, infrared telescopes, uh, giving us whole new views of the cosmos. We even have gravitational wave telescopes that are detecting vibrations in space-time from the most violent events in the universe, such as colliding black holes and supernovas exploding. It's a whole new universe since Hubble's day, and I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you. There we go. We'll take questions for a few minutes, and then we'll uh, let everyone dismiss to um, out in the uh, lobby. Uh, we do have surveys about the lecture. If you would like to register your survey with us, uh, next week we are drawing, if you write legibly, for a copy of Marcia's book that she signed, and you can read all about this story yourself. OK? So please come down if you have questions. Otherwise, you'll have to listen to me after. There's going to be a brave soul, yes. <laughs> You said that there was another man who was working at that who saw that the galaxies were, who thought he saw the galaxies rotating. Do you know why we saw that? Yes. What he did, and, and Hubble finally figured this out, uh, Adrian von Manen, over the years, he was a spectroscopist, he would take pictures of Andromeda year after year after year, or, or month after month after month, and he would take the plates, and he also gathered plates from other uh, people who had uh, uh, measured or t taken pictures of Andromeda. And he would put it under, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, double blink 
you know, where you put, you compare two photos and you blink back and forth uh, between them to see if a star has moved. He did that with Andromeda to see how the, the stars were moving. And he was sure that he was seeing like a plate from 1918 and comparing it with a plate of 1919. He was sure that he was seeing some of the stars shift very slightly around. And he was uh, interpreting that as a movement of rotation. And he was an excellent spectroscopist. So no one doubted his, uh, his work because they said, God, he really knows what he's doing. He must have seen a movement. So he was interpreting that by watching, by pinpointing certain stars within Andromeda and watching from over the years, plate to plate, where the, how that star was positioned and if it had moved over the years. And it turns out when Hubble actually later on did an intensive investigation, he took it on, he discovered that, well, when he took in photos of Andromeda from other telescopes, they weren't calibrated. They were taken by different telescopes with different filters. They shouldn't have been used. He didn't carry out a meticulous, careful, controlled study of the Andromeda galaxy and how it changed over time. He was comparing apples and oranges, and he was seeing motions that weren't there. But uh, Hubble finally did a meticulous study to prove that is where and, uh, von Manen made his mistake. Andromeda truly wasn't rotating, not, in the, not in as fast. I mean, it may be rotating, but it, not the way he was uh, uh, saying that it was. Uh, so uh, Hubble was right, and von Manen was wrong. And I say in my book that uh, they really, uh, Hubble really was mad at, at what von Manen had done to interfere with his research, and uh, uh, they, they had angry words between one another. And uh, I, I described it as uh, for the rest of their professional lives, they would pass in the, the Mount Wilson headquarters, never speaking to one another like ships passing in the night. <laughs> they, they kept their distance from one another after that, yes. Okay, we have some anonymous questions from the audience who are here. Oh. So the first question is, why are some galaxies moving closer, parentheses, blue shift? Uh, so they're asking, is it due to like a blue shift or a red shift? Is why are some galaxies blue shifted? Yes. Yes. Okay. Why are some moving closer to us and not receding? Yes. Yeah. Andromeda is moving towards us. Uh, because of the gravitational attraction. We are so close to one another. We're all sort of part of the, what they call the local cluster. There is enough gravitational attraction between the local galaxies, Andromeda, Triangulum, the Milky Way, that we are actually drawing closer together. The gravitational attraction overwhelms the, the fact that space-time is expanding outward. So they are still traveling towards one another because of the gravitational pull of the galaxies. We're so close to one another that the gravitational attraction is stronger, and so they remain moving towards one another to the point that Andromeda and the Milky Way are actually going to collide at one point. Is it, what, four or five billion years from now? Somebody might know a better figure. So. Uh, uh, so watch out for that big collision. <laughs> Actually, it, it's funny, when you have a ga galaxy collision, most of the stars just pass through one another, there's no harm. The, the biggest uh, uh, effect will be the two supermassive black holes, one in Andromeda and one in the Milky Way. They'll eventually, when the galaxies come together, they're going to start circling around one another, and at some point, those two supermassive black holes are going to collide, creating the biggest, biggest energetic effect. That is the biggest energetic effect that you have in the universe is when two supermassive black holes collide. In fact, the recent work that the, uh, that it just came out in the past couple months, 
of uh, they had taken through uh, watching the pulses of neutron stars. They discovered this background of gravity, gravitational waves that are being emitted as supermassive black holes throughout the universe collide. And you have this background of, of gravitational radiation from this event. Uh, but the rest of, you know, when galaxies are further enough away, then space-time will carry them outward, and that's when they will be moving away from us, stretching the light waves and making the redshift, the redder light. So only when uh, in clusters of galaxies uh, do you, you still have the gravitational attraction bringing them closer together. I hope that the astronomers in the audience, I hope I made the correct that was great. interpretation. <laughs> Was this co cosmological constant already being discussed in this period? I'm sorry, I didn't hear fully. The cosmological constant was already being discussed in this period? Let me think. No, not at this point, because what happened was Einstein, uh, when he came out with his uh, uh, general theory of relativity, he was wedded to that idea that the universe was stable and unchanging. And he knew that uh, without the cosmological constant, there would be a motion of space-time, co either collapsing or it could go either way. It could have been moving inward or outward. He added the cosmological constant in, well, let me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm misspeaking uh, uh, here. Uh, there was the question of if the universe is expanding. Oh, I, I should ask an astronomer to, uh, I'm, I'm getting confused now. Uh, so, so he added the cosmological term into GR precisely to counterbalance any expansion in the solutions to the That's equations. That's right. I'm sorry. Right. Counterbalance, yeah. And it was this evidence that caused Einstein to be like, holy crap, that was stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing up the terms as to what, who is doing what. Uh, he wanted the universe steady, and he added the cosmological constant as a balance, that the cosmological constant uh, would work against the gravitational attraction, because if the universe was steady, there was the question of, well, if the universe is steady, and the, you have all that gravitational attraction between all those galaxies, they should be moving towards one another, and the universe will collapse. And so the cosmological constant was an answer to maintain his steady. The cosmological constant is like anti-gravity. It really acts like anti-gravity. Things will be moving apart. And so it's like an equilibrium then. The gravitational attraction moves in, the cosmological uh, moves out, the constant makes it move out, and then it just stays in place. But then they found the expanding universe, and so he said, well, my equation explains that itself. I don't need the cosmological constant, and he tossed it out. It was brought back in 1999 when they discovered that the universe is accelerating. Now, Einstein's theory alone cannot explain an acceleration, but if you add the cos cosmological constant back in with that little anti-gravity, woo, you get acceleration along with an expansion. So that's why it's being discussed now, again, today. But uh, upon the, uh, from the 1931 uh, until 1999, the cosmological constant was a curiosity. People played, theorists played with it a lot, but uh, uh, it wasn't really actively discussed again until the, they discovered the acceleration of the universe. All right, a lot of people like asking anonymous questions. Uh, so this one is, did any of these astronomers win a Nobel Prize for their discovery? No. Though, Henrietta Leavitt was nominated, uh, and she should. She deserved. She literally uh, 
handed over the tool that allowed this to happen. And she, there was a man who wrote to Harvard College Observatory inquiring about her work because he said, I forget the name of the man, but he said he wanted to nominate her for the Nobel Prize in Physics. And Harlow Shapley had to write back with the sad news that she had already died. And so they do not give Nobel Prizes uh, to those who have passed away, only the living. So she, if she had continued working, she had stomach cancer. She died in her 50s. Uh, she died fairly soon after discovering the Levitt Law. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, she did not, uh, wasn't able to achieve that uh, uh, honor. Uh, Hubble, some people always wondered why Hubble never got it is because in his era, astronomy really wasn't considered physics. <laughs> and they didn't really think about put, giving astronomical discoveries a Nobel Prize in physics. And I'm trying to remember what may have broken that. Um, I'd have to look back at the Nobel Prizes. Who was the first to, uh, to break that, uh, uh, that old tradition? So uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think anyone ever got a Nobel Prize for any of this cosmological work. But of course, there have been plenty uh, uh, since then for the later work, especially with the cosmological, cosmic microwave background has gotten it. Gravitational waves uh, have gotten it. Uh, the discovery of neutron stars, even though Jocelyn Bell didn't get it, and she should have. <laughs> And uh, uh, so they slowly have now begun to, uh, to consider the uh, astronomy and astrophysics as part of the physics prize. But they didn't in Hubble's day. Hi. Uh, so Los uh, LA Times published an article regarding some of the difficulty with maintaining the Wilson Observatory now over 100 years into yes. its inception. Um, right now, it seems like it's being run by volunteers, very dedicated volunteers. It's and, a private foundation. And, um, and yeah, and a couple of years ago, uh, there were major fires nearby. I, I know I was I was living in Los Angeles at oh, the time, yeah. just constantly refreshing the feed to it see got how the very observatory close. was doing. It yeah, got exactly. very close. It was on the campus, right? Yeah. So I'm curious what, um, if you visited the observatory, um, what are your thoughts on um, what we should be doing to maybe protect this cultural heritage for astronomy um, and what you see the, the future for Mount Wilson at least? I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers. In fact, uh, George Ellery Hale's grandson is part of the private foundation and uh, uh, I have visited many times. In fact, I had the great honor of actually giving a lecture within the dome of the 100 inch uh, to a, an audience that are part of the, the Mount Wilson uh, Foundation group. This was about two years ago, two or three years ago. And uh, oh, in fact, no, I'm sorry. It must have been 2019 because it was celebrating the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of its first observations. And uh, uh, that was an amazing moment. And I actually got to look through the telescope. They set it up that they, they put an eyepiece so you could actually uh, uh, look through the eyepiece. And I saw, I think, the Triangulum Galaxy. I saw a nebula. It was just, just a tremendous uh, visit. I think this is a cultural heritage. It should be an international cultural heritage site. And I would really encourage uh, you know, some funding to, uh, to maintain it as a museum. I mean, this is where we literally discovered the modern universe. And I think that, you know, no, you don't have to keep the whole uh, complex alive and, and, and working, but maybe just enough to keep the 100-inch telescope and its dome in condition and running and uh, use it for uh, educational purposes. Uh, and I'm wishing the, the private foundation, I'm, I'm wishing them all the best in raising enough money to keep that going. And I'm hoping that is 
you know, going to occur into the future. Right now, I think they're okay, but I'm not sure. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I think it would be a great loss. Uh, I'm trying to think of, I mean, we keep old aircraft carriers and lots of other great big things alive to remember past accomplishments in science. Um, why not the 100-inch telescope and the discovery of the modern universe? That uh, I often like to say that it was as if we had been living on one square yard of, of Earth and suddenly realizing that there are rivers and continents and mountains, a whole different world than we had imagined than this one sod of, of grass. Um, and I think we should maintain that heritage. That's my feeling. I'm, I'm great into history, and I love when I'm on travel looking back at uh, how things came to be and what their origins are. And I think that's important to keep that alive of how this, how this has been maintained. OK. Any last question before we wrap it up for the evening? Thank you for being okay. a wonderful audience. Thank you, everyone. Let's give Marsha a round of applause. So please join us and our volunteers outside. Uh, we're happy to talk to you at great length about astronomy and writing about science. And we hope to see you again sometime. Thank you, everyone.